Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure now to welcome up Professor Nicholas Humphrey from the University of Cambridge. Can psychists beware? We're going to hear about the limits of sentience. Good, it's there at last. Um, sorry about that delay. Um, well, uh, it's wonderful to be in such a diverse meeting. Uh, ever, and I have similar titles to our talks, but um, I think my talk could not be more different from hers. I very, uh, tremendously admire her approach to things, but it's rather different from the kind of way I'm going to discuss issues this morning. I'm going to be talking about sentence at a much higher level uh, about phenomenal consciousness. Um, I want to know what sentience is, what phenomenal consciousness is, and where it is. Just for who else besides ourselves is it like something to see red or to feel pain? And I'm not sure at all that that's implied by anything which Ava has talked about yet. Um, I know there are many other meanings of consciousness and they've been flying around this meeting, but um, this is the one which I think we can all agree in the end is the one we care about, phenomenal consciousness. It's that which really matters. Now, <clears throat> most of us, I think, believe that this sentience club, Phenomenal Consciousness Club, does extend to many other animals, even if no animal makes such a deal of it as we ourselves do. Some of us think that all living things are sentient. Some of us think that intelligent machines will one day be sentient. Some think that phenomenal consciousness is a basic property of organized matter, so that matter matters to itself. Well, whatever answers we come to, we want to know the answers for two reasons. One is simply to fill in the picture of the world around us. It's intellect intellectually provoking not to know the facts about what life lies beneath the surface of other creatures' lives. As explorers, we want to lift the veil. But the other reason is a weightier one. We want to know who or what else is sentient so as to know where our moral obligations lie. What relevance do we have to the lives of others? In whatever world we live, what ethical footprint do we live? Well, I've just 20 minutes, um, and I'm going to use this time simply to outline a very bare theory of sentience that I hope can help at least to guide the discussion of those bigger issues. But we have to start by narrowing the possibilities. So I'm going to start by assuming that sentience is not present everywhere. I'm not a panpsychist, and in fact, I can't make sense of that position. I'll assume it is, in fact, a biological phenomenon. Um, when and where it exists, it's a feature of animal minds. Maybe I should include plant, plant minds, at least in principle. And this means it's almost certainly an evolutionary adaptation. It's been shaped by natural selection. So I'll take humans as the starting point, and I want to discuss what sentience is and how it works in us. Um, I think it's best to start at the top rather than at the bottom, as, as Eva uh, did in her talk. I want to point to the benefits that phenomenal consciousness brings us, and then which, and ask whether those might explain why it's been selected in our ancestors. And if we have answers to the what and the why of sentence for humans, we'll hopefully be in a better position to make informed guesses about who else. But be warned, the story I'm going to tell is not a simple one. I'm not going to pluck a statistic out of the air, such as integrated information, and say, problem solved. Well, first, some definitions. I'm not going to make too much of a meal of this, but we need something. I take it that what we mean by sentence is the faculty of experiencing sensations with phenomenal properties. That's to say, for a sentient creature, it's like something to have sensations, to interact with sensory stimuli arriving at the body's surface. It's like something to have your hair pulled, or to roast your nose in front of a fire, or to run through the cold salt waves. Sensation, let's be clear, is not the same thing as perception. Perception is the way you represent the external world, the waves as such, the fire as such. But sensation is something much more personal. It's the way you represent what's happening to you and how you, as a subject, evaluate it. The pain is in your toe and it's horrible. The sweet taste is on your tongue and it's sickly. The red light is before your eyes, and it's stirring you up. It's as if in having sensations, 
You're both registering the objective fact of stimulation and expressing your personal bodily opinion about it. And indeed, as we'll see shortly, I think you are doing just that. But it's the way you do it that's so surprising. What you represent the bodily opinion as. Where do these extra qualitative dimensions come from? What can make the subjective present created by sensations seem so rich and deep as if you are living in thick time? What can Kandinsky mean when he writes, color is the power which directly influences the soul. Color is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. Well, prompted by Kandinsky, I'd like to propose a rather grand analogy. When you're a subject of sensations, it's as if you're sitting at the console of a cinema organ, creating a line of music to express your experience of what's happening before your eyes. The themes for the organist are highly practiced, so you don't have to think about the picture and what to play in response. You just find yourself doing it. Your performance follows what's happening on screen, but it doesn't merely track the picture. It adds a personal dimension and colors it with emotion. And on top of all, it does add a mysterious dimension of harmony and temporal depth. But now let's ask what it's like for you, the organist, um, to, to, be, to be there in that position. You're watching the screen and you're making something of it with your body. What could you discover about the movie and how you feel about it by attending to your own performance? Well, crucially, you have two sources of information. One, you are playing the keyboard and you can follow your own actions. You have immediate access to what you are doing. And then, secondly, you can listen to the sound of the music that you're making. So you can learn about your own reactions at one remove. And on this level, I believe the analogy captures a cru crucial feature of phenomenal experience, the duality of access to what it's like. In the words of the poet Ossip Mandelstam, you are the gardener and also the flower. I'll come back to that. Okay, but this, of course, is just an analogy. So let's ask about what is the reality and how it evolved. I'll outline the theory I've developed over a good many years now. My starting point is that sensations are indeed an active response to sensory stimulation. There's something the subject is doing. They are, or at least they once were, a form of bodily expression, an affect-laden response to stimuli arriving at the body's surface. Imagine a primitive animal floating in the primeval organ. Things are happening to it. Chemicals wash up against it. Pressure waves bump it. Light falls on it. These things matter to it. And so, for example, it responds to the light by turning away. It doesn't like the light. Perhaps it's, um, it's, perhaps it's uh, pleased by the chemical stimulations there, um, and perhaps uh, it, it's more relaxed about the uh, pressure waves. These responses are reflex behaviors. They're wriggles of rejection or, accept or acceptance, I've called them in the past. They've been shaped by natural selection so as to be adaptive. They enact what the stimulation means to the animal, but to begin with, of course, the animal is in no way mentally aware of what's going on. However, as these creatures evolve, there does come a point when they would stand to benefit from having a mental representation of the stimulus. What's going on here? And as it happens, there's a neat way of doing this. The animal has simply to monitor its own response. The response may be purely reflex, 
but it potentially carries loads of information about the external stimulus, what kind of stimulus it is, where it's occurring, and especially what import it has for the animal's well-being. So the animal can represent what the stimulation means by the simple trick of copying its own motor command signals by making perhaps what, what was others people call an efference copy of the signals it's sending to make the response. The response enacts the meaning, the command signals create the response, thus the efference copy directly captures the meaning. Now, if this is how it's done, and I'm pretty certain of it, then sensation, let's now call it that, originates as a kind of unmediated feeling by doing. But of course, things were never going to stay like that. As these creatures evolved further and developed more sophisticated behavior, there's bound to come a point when the original bodily responses are no longer appropriate. The animal no longer wants to recoil reflexly from light, say, and yet it does still want to know that light is falling on its body and that it doesn't like it. Then what to do? The answer natural hit selection hits on is ingenious. It is for the reflex responses to become internalized, or as I've put it, privatized. Let's stop working. So they no longer now result in actual bodily behavior, but there is still an efference copy that can be read to represent what's happening. Okay, so let's fast forward to where we are today, to where we humans are. The upshot is that when you experience sensory stimulation, you're still responding with the ancient action pattern handed down from your ancestors. But my thing's not working now. Um, uh, and you can still uh, you can and you can still read it, but now it's become a virtual expression occurring at the level of a virtual body inside your own head. So let's take the case of seeing red, for example. Red light arrives at your eyes, and next thing behind the scenes, you make a virtual affective response to it. Here it is. It's an ongoing response, and I'll call it reading. And now, where's your sensation in all of this? The sensation is still your reading of a copy of your own response. To have the sensation of red is to find yourself reading. So to take stock, I hope you've noticed how this story is converging with the analogy I offered earlier. You're seated at the organ, matching your responses to the stream of stimulation, pumping out a stream of motor commands that express what you feel and following what's happening via the efference copy. Except, of course, you're watching, you're checking on your own performance, but of course there is something rather major missing. You may be having a sensation, but it's a pretty thin one. Where's the music? Where's the beef? It's obvious the, that the evolution of sensory experience can't have rested here. There has to be another chapter to the story, a chapter that tells of some dramatic development that fills out sensations and adds the phenomenal richness we humans prize so highly. Well, I believe the key to this lies with the process of privatization that I've just described. Back at the beginning, in primitive animals, the responses to sensory stimuli took place at the site of stimulation on the body's surface. Once privatized, however, the responses now ended within the brain. And this had a remarkable, even if it was fortuitous, a remarkable result. It meant that a feedback loop was created between the motor and sensory regions of the brain, a loop with the capacity to, to sustain recursive activity, going round and round, catching its own tail. And this was potentially game-changing. Crucially, it meant that the activity could be drawn out in time so as to create the thick moment of sensory consciousness. But more than this, it meant that the activity could be channeled and stabilized into a remarkable, mathemat into a remarkable mathematical object. Suppose that each time the activity circles around this circuit, the transmission from input to output, the characteristics of that, is altered by the activity the previous time around. 
then the development activity in the circuit is going to be described by a delay differential equation. And typically, this means it will either develop chaotically or else it will settle into a complex attractor state. <clears throat> this film clip shows an example of just such a complex pattern developing in a feedback loop, a simple feedback loop. Now, this attractor exists in just three dimensions, but often the attractor will turn out to be very much more complicated with remarkable hyperdimensional properties. So, think now what this could mean for the evolution of sensations. With all those extra dimensions to play with, the way was open for natural selection to radically transform the properties of the looping sensory responses, and thus the properties of the sensations that copy them. Sensations could be lifted into the realm of hyperreality, becoming ethereal objects worth contemplating as phenomena in their own right. And I think that's just what happened. So back to the organist inside your head. Your reading, you'll see, has now undergone a remarkable upshift, uplift. Now there's wind in the bellow of the organ. We can do better than plain red light. Let's jazz it up a bit. Now, I'll remind you, you still have immediate access uh, to your performance through the efference copy of what you're doing. But now, in addition, you can inspect and introspect the surreal work of art that you're creating. And I want to stress again the significance of this dual access. I think it does much to explain the, why theorists are so often at cross purposes about the status of phenomenal consciousness. Are the phenomenal properties real or are they an illusion? Are they intrinsic or are they derived? Are they immediate or are they secondary? When you are both the gardener and the flower, the answer can be both. So this is where we've arrived. This is, the, what, is it what makes it what it's like for us to have sensations, us humans. But we've arrived there by stages, and presumably every stage must have brought some distinct benefit to biological survival. So just why did evolution take this course? It's easy to explain the earliest stage where our primitive ancestors took advantage of an efferent copy to represent the meaning of bodily stimulation. Obviously, it's a good idea to have sensations that carry information about what's happening to you and how it affects you. It's the second stage, where sensations took off to become elaborated, phenomenal sensations that's much more of a challenge to explain. Well, I suggest we look again at that first stage. We've already remarked uh, that this particular way of representing things was never a neutral objective one. Your sensations represent what the stimulation means to you, how you feel, and they do this by taking account of what you're doing using an efference copy, which as Eva remarked is basic to the na very nature of understanding oneself. So the fact is that sensations have always been as much about being you as about the external stimulation. It would seem then that from the beginnings, sens beginning, sensations might have been pre-adapted to play a rather special, rather grander role. They were ripe to be co-opted to lay the foundations of the self. The philosopher David Hume famously concluded that he himself was indeed nothing else than a bundle of sensations. For my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular sensation or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. When my sensations are removed for any time as by sound sleep, I may truly be said not to exist. But Hume has a bit of a problem with this. 
he worries that this sensation-based self is nothing to be proud of. He thinks it lacks substance. He likens sensory experience to a theater with a constantly shifting display of sensations that successively make their appearance, pass, repass, glide away, and mingle in an infinite variety of postures and situations. And he goes on, there is properly no simplicity in it at one time, no identity indifferent, nor have we the most distant notion of the place where these scenes are represented or of the materials of which it's composed. How then, he asks, can sensations underpin the self with a big S, the I, the thread that runs through our mental lives? Well, is this going to mean that this role for sensations is a non-starter? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that Hume's worry is groundless. <clears throat> I'd agree that if sensations had remained unelaborated and voiceless, as they presumably have done in relatively primitive creatures, he would be right to question whether they're up to the job of supporting a robust sense of self. <laughs> but surely that's precisely why natural selection might have moved in to reinvent sensations giving them the added oomph that lifts them into the sphere of phenomenal significance. <clears throat> the fact is, Hume is seriously underestimating sensations as we human beings experience them. He says we don't have a notion of where our experience is located or what it's materially made of, but he's wrong. We do have a notion. Actually, we each have first-hand evidence that sensations are out of this world. The where of phenomenal experience is nowhere and the materials are immaterial. That's the wonder of it. Sensations give us the feeling that there is an essential non-physical dimension to our lives. They fix our sense of self as a, bun as a bubble of spiritual substance floating above a world of things. And now we see why natural selection would have done this. Because for humans at least, a self of this kind is hugely adaptive. It gives us something substantive to hold on to, something to aim for, a ball to keep in the air. It provides us with a remarkable imperative to invest in our own future. It becomes a focus of our hopes and desires and in the future of others like ourselves. For humans, the experience of phenomenal, phenomenal consciousness is what makes us conceive of ourselves and others like us uh, as significant individuals. Every one of us becomes a person an independent, private, responsible, free-willed locus of conscious being. Consciousness imbues the self with metaphysical significance and so changes the value we place on our own and other lives. <clears throat> now, how far do we share this conception of the self and this ambition for self-advancement with other non-human creatures? <clears throat> Who here is an insider to consciousness as we are? Well. That's the question, and it's a question that perhaps wisely I've left myself almost no time to answer. <clears throat> um, I said at the start that if we have answers to the what and the why of sentience for humans, we'll be in a better position to make informed guesses about who else has it. Well, very briefly, where has this discussion got us to? First, as to the what. Phenomenal consciousness, as we've seen, is anything but simple. Philosophers sometimes talk of conscious sensations as raw feels, the redness of red, the paininess of pain. But the reality is that sensations as we experience them are very far from raw. They are thoroughly cooked. They are the culmination of a remarkable evolutionary trajectory. Arguably, sentience is the jewel in the crown of brain and cognitive evolution. So when it comes to us asking who, I think we can rule out on purely structural grounds any creature that hasn't got the right kind of brain and the right kind of history. The right kind of brain means, at the very least, a brain capable of housing the intricate circuitry required to generate attractor states with higher order phenomenal properties, to represent them in a double way, and what's more, to be inspired by the experience. And I'd say this means that phenomenal consciousness can only exist in large-brained, intelligent animals. Dogs, elephants, octopuses maybe, lobsters, snails, butterflies. Not a chance. 
But of course, the right kind of brain with the right kind of history means much more than this. It means a brain that not only has the structural potential to deliver phenomenal consciousness, but has been designed to actually deliver it. And since, since this design can only have arisen through selection, this in turn means a brain whose owner can reap the survival benefits of having a phenomenally conscious self. So this is the why of sentence, and I think this imposes much tighter constraints on the who. It means we can further rule out any creature whose behavioral ecology and lifestyle would make having this grand sense of self superfluous. In modern humans, the conscious self provides its, proves its worth in the context of a social system that emphasizes individualism and autonomy and is supported by a rich language-based culture. We can be sure that no non-human animal is capable of making such a big deal of the self as humans do. If non-human animals have souls, well, they certainly don't know they've got them, um, and that's what counts. <laughs> This could mean that sentience as we know it is a very recent innovation. It could even mean that humans are the only sentient, phenomenally conscious creatures on Earth. But I don't think we need to take quite such a radical line. <clears throat> there are several non-human species for which there's behavioral evidence of self-consciousness and individualism. Elephants, dogs, crows, they all show at least glimmers of personhood. But now I'd rule out octopuses. I know of no reason to believe that octopuses conceive of themselves as persons or as anything like that. The bottom line is that phenomenal consciousness would be wasted in most creatures, even those with brains that are, how, that are large enough to house it. Suppose we could, in fact, genetically engineer an octopus to have phenomenal consciousness. I believe the new genes would not be maintained by selection because the newfound selfhood would make little known or no difference to the octopus's survival in its relatively asocial and independent world. But hey, we're in Switzerland, so we're in the home of the cuckoo clock. So let me end with another contrived analogy. Um, I hope no one will take offense. Um, here's a French watch that represents the time in two ways. And here's a Swiss clock that does the same. Who's going to buy the Swiss clock and keep on winding it up? Well, of course, the answer is only the highly advanced, spiritually superior people who live here love their clocks and find the extravagant display a cause for national pride. So no wonder the Swiss leave the French standing. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much.